Welcome, uh, good afternoon, uh, and welcome at uh, the April seminar, the next April seminar. We had a seminar earlier with uh, Jan Eckhout, um, and uh, now we're very glad to uh, that Patricio Korsenievich was uh, able to uh, join us for this seminar and to give a talk on global patterns of inequality. Um, Roberto Pat Patricio Korsenievich is a professor of sociology and associate dean at uh, the Faculty of um, uh, the College of Behavioral and Social Sciences at the University of Maryland, uh, where it's more or less 10 o'clock now, I think. Um, and he uh, wrote a book, uh, co-authored with uh, Timothy uh, Moran on unveiling inequality, which took a world historical perspective, uh, a much lower, larger perspective than we are used to take, even if in, in the meantime, of course, uh, Quite some books appeared, um, were edited also on inequality, uh, with all, which also took uh, such a long-term uh, perspective. Uh, but now this, uh, this seminar will uh, focus on world magnates and, um, and, and his uh, latest work on mapping innovations in creative destruction. Um, Patricio, I will give you the floor for like uh, 45 minutes, after which we can engage into questions and answers. So we have uh, an audience uh, here sitting in the room and also uh, online. I would uh, like to propose that uh, for uh, people who would uh, like to ask a question, you do not have to wait for asking the question until the end of the session. You can do it already on the chat. Uh, online, yeah. But please take care to put off your volume. Uh, that's very important in in order not to have interference with the the auditory uh, audio. Okay. Thank you. So, uh, Patricio, go ahead. Well, thank you very much. Um, I really appreciate this invitation uh, to talk to you. It, I would like to thank, I'm not sure whether I'm pronouncing it right, April for the invitation, and in particular, Tom Descart, who initially extended uh, the invitation, and Lucas Leitner, who has been handling a lot of the logistical issues. Uh, I said I am very happy to have this opportunity because for the last couple of years, I've been in, in more of an administrative role here at the university. And it's not that frequently that I get to go back to, uh, to my research, uh, much to my dismay, because this is a project that is uh, about 80% complete. And, and, and we're now uh, uh, trying to find the time to uh, uh, finish producing the book that is going to come out of this uh, research uh, and, and making uh, publicly available the data set that we've been uh, collecting. So, so the, 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 the presentation uh, not only serves as a reminder of the uh, urgency in completing that project, uh, but serves as a, a strong uh, uh, incentive to go back to that uh, research. So again, thank you very much for this opportunity. Um, I, I, at the early stages of the invitation, Tom asked me to send a couple articles that illustrated uh, the broader framework that we're using in some of my work. So uh, here I'm not going to speak too much about how this relates to our broader interest in global patterns of inequality and our effort to map out more precisely those global patterns over a long period of time. Instead, I'm going to focus on why we began collecting data on these world magnates, and I will try to give you a sense of what the data are suggesting. And I'll basically go through some slides that provide different kinds of visualization of what we're doing with the data that we have been collecting. And I say we, because this project started with a graduate student here at the University of Maryland named Scott Albrecht, who since, uh, since the beginning of the project moved on to the US Census. And I'm currently working very closely with Corey Payne from Just Hopkins University, uh, who is my co-author. 
very initial level, the aim is to simply produce an empirical mapping of the global economic elite between 1500 and 2015. Um, we, we started this project by uh, generating a by, by generating a data set drawn from the uh, billionaires list that is uh, produced by Forbes, and we published a couple articles on that data set, uh, which focuses on the period between the end of the 20th century and and the first few decades of the 21st century. In the process of, of constructing that data set and analyzing some of the patterns, uh, we figured that it would be very interesting to compare uh, these, these, these data with trends in the late 19th century and, and the period of uh, intense industrialization of that time. And uh, we began <laughs> moving uh, further and further backwards in time and ended up with this uh, uh, with the start date of 1500. Uh, I think that the uh, technology has developed in ways that have facilitated the collection of this kind of data about which I will say a little bit more later uh, but but the idea is that if we had this data available to us, we could get a better understanding of how the global economic elite developed temporarily, spatially, and across economic networks. Uh, to put it in, in uh, uh, to give it a little bit more of theoretical context, uh, this work is influenced on the one hand by Joseph Schumpeter's concept of creative destruction, which is a notion that we have a, a that we have explored in our other work on inequality as a way of understanding inequality as a symptom of continuous processes of creative destruction. The notion we have found is very appealing, but for the most part, there have been a little data that looks systematically about at how waves of creative destruction moved over time. And then it is also informed by some of our work developed within the paradigm of a world systems approach. And within that paradigm, there are some very specific ar arguments about historical cycles of accumulation and hegemony. That are perhaps best exemplified by the work of Giovanni Arrighi in his book, The Long 20th Century. Uh, and so these are some of the uh, issues that inform uh, our research from a more theoretical point of view. What we have tried in our research is always to bring these different approaches together to better understand changing patterns of inequality. Just as a, a, as a quick reference to a Giovanni Arrighi, so you'll understand a, some of the context for how we frame the arguments later. A, this is taken from his book, The Long 20th Century. A, in that book, he has an argument about the a, force, what he calls the four systematic cycles of accumulation that have characterized the period that we're looking at. We have this first long cycle that goes from the 15th to 16th century, which he calls the Genoese cycle, where not only Genoa, but other Italian city-states were involved. Uh, the second cycle is what he calls the long 17th century, and uh, he characterizes that as the Dutch cycle of hegemony. Then he has the British cycle of hegemony, characterizing most of what he calls the long 19th century. Uh, uh, Again, he calls that the British cycle of hegemony, and finally the U.S. cycle of hegemony, beginning uh, sometime around the late 20th century and moving into our days. Uh, you'll notice here that part of the argument is that these cycles get briefer and briefer over time. Uh, that they move from uh, a length of 220 years in the first cycle to 180 years in the second cycle, 
130 years in the third cycle and 100 years in the US cycle of accumulation. And again, this is his theoretical representation of the arguments in the long 20th century. And part of what we were seeking to do with our collection of this data it, it was to assess whether there is in fact some kind of correlation between the patterns exhibited in the data and Giovanni Arrighi's arguments in the long 20th century. Okay, so let me talk about very briefly so I can move directly to the data. There, there, we can summarize the aims of the project at these three different levels. Uh, conceptually, the project seeks to provide greater precision to the identification of cycles of accumulation as distinct from cycles to, of hegemony to better understand the relationship between the two. And I'm not going to talk too much about this issue in this presentation because it is not as pertinent to the uh, particular topic that we're trying to address here from the point of view of inequality. Uh, methodologically, we're trying to use wealth as an indicator uh, to map the spatial distribution over time of the epicenters of wealth accumulation and to conduct this research in ways that allow for unexpected surprises. Uh, I think that in the in, in many of the social sciences that are dedicated to the study of these processes, there are often the theoretical assumptions about the nature of these epicenters of wealth accumulation uh, that uh, uh, leave little room for uh, the possibility that data might, uh, uh, might challenge these existing theoretical frameworks. Eh? And in our work, we were trying to be conscientious about allowing for these unexplained surprises to uh, uh, reveal, uh, to, to become revealed in the data. Uh, and then there's a broader theoretical slash empirical process of trying to reassess patterns of wealth accumulation in various dimensions. Uh, the timing of these patterns of accumulation, their spatial location, the type of activities that characterize different strategies of wealth accumulation, and the overall relationship between uh, these, these uh, patterns of accumulation and different uh, forms of power arrangements. So the data collection itself, I'll again talk briefly about this so we can then move on to the data. As I mentioned before, the project it started with this collection of data on the 1987 to 2015 Forbes list of billionaires. It, but eventually got extended to the 1500 to 1980 period. And I mentioned before that uh, technology has only recently make, made this kind of project possible. Uh, if you would have tried to do anything similar 40, 50 years ago, you would have had to uh, uh, develop an extremely uh, extensive network of scholars who would have the uh, familiarity with the bibliographies of their respected uh, countries or regions of the world to be able to identify the individuals that would be included in this list. And obviously, with a uh, with, with uh, the ability to conduct word searches and, 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 and use the, uh, uh, the, the various possibilities of data collections that have been included in the data set and uh, even extensive narrative collections that have been included in data sets that are machine readable, uh, these processes have become greatly simplified. I often like to use uh, the metaphor of novas. You know, in, in the 1920s, 
the identification of novas in the universe was an extremely arduous process because you had to uh, manually compare transparency of the universe of, of certain areas of the universe at uh, different points in time to try to locate dots of light that show up in one transparency but not the other and that was the procedure for identifying novas the the, the rate of identification of novas uh, in 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 the through the 1920s, 1930s was about one or two a year. It was an extremely arduous process. And obviously with machine reading and the ability to apply uh, computing technologies, the rate of identification of NOVAs has expanded exponentially. That makes us also very aware that what we're collecting here is a very preliminary data set that is likely to change substantially in the future as others uh, continue the task of identifying uh, alternative sources for uh, identifying these data points. We have drawn on some lists of uh, wealthy individuals that are dedicated to the topic. We have done extensive bibliographical research uh, entering a whole range of keywords. We have used various kinds of biographical encyclopedias. We have also done uh, applied the same kind of research procedures to particular production trade and consumption networks that were salient over the whole period under consideration to try to identify key individuals that were associated with the production chains and, and distribution chains involved in particular commodities. And we have also used a, 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 a functional equivalent of snowball sampling in which we can use individuals identified in the database to analyze the networks in which they were embedded in order to identify other potential candidates for the database. So, I think that's all I'll say about the procedures for data collection. And the variables that we're collecting in this effort, uh, on the one hand, uh, there's some demographic information about the individuals, the birth year, the birth country or region of the world, the, the year of death, uh, there's sex, the religion. Uh, uh, besides the demographic information, there's a assessments of levels of wealth with various degrees of confidence, depending on the sources that were used to identify these individuals and the amount of information available on them. Uh, we can also identify uh, in many cases, not all, the type of industry that in which they were involved, what were the geographical areas of operation and whether there were any particular relationships to uh, existing states. Uh, we can also reconstruct the role that the family and business type played with particular individuals and also accumulated versus biogra biographical details, including uh, the original source of their wealth and whether uh, this was a product of inheritances or, or uh, the, 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 the accumulation of wealth in more specific activities. Okay, so that's the background. Let me move on to the data. What I'm going to provide first is a visualization of where these individuals in the database were located at, uh, over time. So you'll see on the upper right hand corner uh, the year uh, as we move over time. And you'll see again where these individuals were located. Um, you should pay attention to uh, uh, obviously, the initial concentration of individuals uh, is in Europe, uh, and, 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 and one has to uh, exercise some uh, tough decisions about uh, how to weigh in the, uh, the extent to which the presence of the, these individuals is an outcome of the size of bibliography available for different uh, regions, but we can tackle that later. Uh, but notice that 
there are also clusters of individuals throughout this period emerging in areas other than in Europe, but then you'll see around the 1800s a, a quick transition to the United States as an epicenter of this activity. So let me move on to the visualization. Uh, the, the, there's some black dots and some red dots. The red dots simply uh, indicate individuals who were identified with financial activities specifically. You notice the appearance of that uh, little cluster in India. I'll mention that later. And uh, to a much lesser extent in China, we're now moving into the 18th century excuse me, the 19th century, and you see the United States quickly becoming populated by these individuals. And these data are gonna go up to 1930. Oh, a little bit later. Okay, and then it, 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 it'll just loop, so I'll stop it there. That's a very quick visualization of where are these individuals appearing. So now let me try to summarize a little bit of the information. If we look at the share, and that's what you have here on the, uh, uh, on, the on, on, on the axis, the percentage of the global elite that is accounted by different regions of the world. You first see the prevalence of these Italian city states that had been identified as key by uh, Giovanni Arrighi. They make their appearance. Uh, they're already very present in the data set in the early stages, uh, 1500s, and they gradually uh, disappear over the next two centuries. The Netherlands is an interesting case because as compared to other cycles of hegemony, uh, the prevalence of uh, 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 these magnates in the Netherlands was not as pronounced, and we can come back to this issue later. Here's the, generally speaking, the English uh, presence in the data set. Uh, is growing throughout this period, reaches a peak around the early 18th century, and then begins to decline. And keep in mind that this always refers to percentage of world magnets. Uh, this does not refer to the overall production wealth in, located in a particular region of the world, which uh, has a relationship to processes of creative uh, destruction as represented by the rise and fall of these magnets, but it's not exclusively sh it's shaped by these particular dimension. Let me see what we're doing in time. And then we have the United States cycle in which uh, the, the uh, prevalence of magnets from the United States becomes a, a, a much more uh, significant than in the previous cycles. So how does this map up with going back with Giovanni Arrighi's uh, cycles of accumulation? Well, the Italy case fits pretty well with his depiction. The UK also fits pretty well with the uh, depiction, although there's an issue here of timing that involves questions about, again, the relationship of wall magnets to the diffusion of processes of, commerce, of, of production, commercialization, and consumption. The Dutch cycle is the one that least follows any of the patterns uh, identified by Arrighi. And then we have the US cycle that uh, 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 has the same kind of fit as the uh, one of the Italian city states and the, uh, the English cycle. With a slight decline in the late 20th century, early 21st century that 
uh, probably has become a little bit more uh, accentuated, but the striking point is that uh, for all the sense of greater uh, diffusion of this wealth across the world in the late 20th century, early 21st century, in relative terms, in terms of the uh, role of uh, the United States uh, uh, share of world magnets, the change has been a, a little bit less dramatic than it's often made up to be. So the data confirm many aspects of the patterns identified by Giovanni Arrighi in the long 20th century, particularly regarding the role of the Italian city states and later the United States. Dutch hegemony or the Dutch cycle here appears to be much more fleeting and ephemeral and accompanied by anarchic uh, interest, by a, an anarchic interstate system. Uh, the, the one might speculate here whether certain patterns of a, a, a inequality within the Netherlands uh, made it less likely for wealth to be concentrated in the hands of a very small elite to the extent that it did in some of the other cases. The timing might need to be reassessed. There does not seem to be an acceleration in the duration of the cycles. And finally, the pattern suggests some specificities to each cycle of accumulation that might entail a reconsideration of cycles of hegemony. Now, let me move to a different set of topics uh, involving what are the kinds of activities in which these world magnets appear to be involved. And first, I'm gonna check my timer. I have about 20 minutes, according to my count left. So um, what I'm going to show you next is another of those quick visualizations. But what these visualizations are going to, this visualization is going to show now is uh, the networks that were, uh, that, that we have been able to identify as being directly linked to particular wall magnets, right? Uh, so in, in, in a sense, it gives you a sense of uh, the extent to which the rise of these world magnets was associated with the expansion of networks between states or regions of the world, quote unquote, um, and, and, and eventually whether these networking had cycles of its own. And what I want you to notice is that when we reach the 20th century, there's a very drastic decline in the extent of this networking. So it's the same kind of a visualization starting in the 1500s. And a, we're mapping out here the networks and the regions of the world that a, became a part of these networks a, a, in the process. Again, notice that even in the more colonial areas, there is the appearance of some magnets associated with linkage to these global networks. Uh, there is a peak in this global networking reaching the 19th century, and then there's a withering away of the networks, obviously, as we approach, uh, as we move into the 20th century. Um, uh, that will become even more dramatic in the interwar period. What were the, act, the precise activities that were involved with these magnets? Uh, so for, if we take the whole period and the, the, the period between the 1500s and the 1800s under consideration, uh, we were able to identify what are the particular activities that uh, seem to be more salient at different points in time. Uh, and um, uh, to some extent, the, 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 to some extent, the graph is self-explanatory, but what I think you should notice here is that a extraction of natural resources 
under commercialization and all the uh, uh, related activities to the expansion of these networks was a central area of wealth accumulation. And there were significant periods of time in which manufacturing and industry, as we would call it, uh, tended to be a little bit more marginal as a key source of industrialization, as a key source of wealth accumulation. It's only in the, uh, uh, towards the eight, late 18th century uh, 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 and, 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 and the 19th century that industrialization comes to occupy the prevalent kind of role that we associate with it today. So um, in the, this graph, what we have is a distribution of these wall magnets by the type of uh, industry or the set of economic activities in which they were involved. Uh, the green line uh, represents manufacturing. So notice again that uh, manufacturing uh, only ex becomes the key area of accumulation reaching about 40% at its peak in around, uh, 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 around the, the, the 19th century. And there, there's a significant decline, which is even more evident when we go to the Forbes data that are collected today. Um, and instead, what we have is this general category of trade that uh, seemed to be the prevalent uh, uh, way, uh, the prevalent set of activities associated with this wealth accumulation and uh, declines significantly during the same period in which manufacturing is increasing. Uh, the reason I'm showing you this graph is in part to summarize some of the information about the key areas of accumulation, but also to point out that these uh, are the, the classifications that we often use in this kind of exercise are uh, historically uh, specific, right? Uh, if we go before the 1800s, economic activities were not as uh, 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 detailed, were not as perceived as being as broken into specific areas of productions. And instead you have this much more generic category of trade that tended to simultaneously bring together aspects of uh, extraction of natural resources and aspects of manufacturing and aspects of uh, distribution and commercialization and so forth. But everything was lumped together into a single category. It's only in the 20th century upon reflection that one sees the kind of differentiation of economic activities that made more sense in the 20th century and that once again lose a lot of relevance in the early 21st century, the boundaries between manufacturing activities and let's say agriculture are much less clear than they were uh, over the 19th and 20th centuries. Uh, this, this graph summarizes the same information from the United States. Um, uh, the United States follows a very similar pattern to what we identified in the previous uh, graph. Here we have the absolute number of billionaires indicated by this black line, uh, and then the percentages broken down for different activities. And you see uh, 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 precisely the same kind of pattern associated with trade and manufacturing that I was pointing out to before. So the composition of national billionaires changes significantly over time. After 1800, this general category of trade declines as a source of wealth accumulation. Uh, there's a singular explosive growth in new wealth of new wealth in manufacturing and extractive uh, industries in the 19th century. And this has often been uh, uh, this has often been uh, uh, perhaps uh, a little bit minimized in the relevant literature. Most of the uh, work focusing on the uh, on the rise of the United States as an epicenter of accumulation tends to associate that rise exclusively with manufacturing. Uh, I think that that tends to underestimate the role 
that the extraction of raw materials had in the United States in promoting peace growth. And again, uh, the, the, some of the particular cases of uh, billionaires in the data set illustrate the, uh, uh, the, the, the tension between these uh, categories clearly as well. Uh, so finally, there's a historical specificity to how production is conceived and how these categories are used. Let me finish by uh, moving away now a little bit from the broader aggregate data and try to convey a, a, a little bit about how we're using this data in order to try to reconstruct a broader sense of patterns of inequality. Uh, I think uh, that the data show that over time, the prevalence of very different modalities of competition, labor exploitation, and market exclusion and inclusion manifest themselves to be themselves an expression of creative destruction rather than a defining characteristic of, let's say, capitalism. Uh, and I'm, I'll skip here the debates about uh, the role of wage labor in any kind of definition of what capitalism is all about. Instead, what I want to give you is a more, uh, a, a more explicit sense of what is the ultimate aim of the construction of this data set. And in a recent paper, we look in much greater detail at the expansion of sugar and slavery in, in, the, in the first three centuries of, of accumulation that are depicted in the data set. The intention here and what we discuss in that uh, paper I'm mentioning, and I extracted these illustrations from, uh, from that paper, is that we can draw on the data set, which focuses exclusively on these individuals at the very top. But, but by better understanding the kinds of activities and networks in which these world magnets were embedded, we're then able to reconstruct, for example, the way in which the accumulation of James Drax, who was a financier and plantation owner and, 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 and merchant, we can then trace how the particular activities in which this world magnet were involved, was involved entailed a much broader set of social arrangements as represented here uh, with stylistic representations of shares of the population in which uh, in Barbados, in these stylized hierarchies, uh, you had a system of sugar production that relied on heavily on slavery as the main form of labor extraction. Uh, Side by side with slavery, you have indenture uh, of a much smaller proportion of white servants who, uh, as distinguished from the enslaved population, had at least some minimal ways of uh, uh, attempting transitions into upper strata within these social arrangements, which in this case would have involved a free landless whites in the island of Barbados. And then you would have the, you have these intermediate categories of free men, small holders who actually had property and of free holders. The ultimate aim of the construction of this data set on the global elite is to then be able to proceed with these kinds of reconstruction of the broader social arrangements that accompanied the shifts in these epicenters of wealth accumulation 
that the data set uh, more uh, directly uh, represents. And uh, furthermore, the data set allows us to identify finally the ancillary activities in which uh, these that, that, that serve to sustain these particular social arrangements involved in sugar production, activities that involved obviously the, all the shipping that it was involved in the triangular trade uh, of, of, of sugar production and enslavement in, 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 in Africa. And uh, it allows us to link an individual like James Drax to other financiers and large traders who also appear in our data set and who are themselves at the very top of arrangements in other areas of the world. The ultimate aim of the exercise being to try to understand inequality in general as a complex historical world phenomena, rather than a, as the intersection, purely as the intersection of domestic arrangements of inequality in different countries of the world. So I think that probably is about 45 minutes. So I'll stop here and uh, address any questions. Or Thank you very much, uh, Patricio. Um, so this is uh, time for questions and answer. You can make use of the, the chat function in Zoom, or you can, of course, just ask your question here. Hi. Should I, can I stop the share of the, the PowerPoint? Yeah, 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 that would be great. Because then I'll be able to see uh, the chat and get a broader sense of the audience as well. Someone would like to start with asking a question? You have one, please? Okay, uh, I will go in front of the camera so people can see me. One second. Tada, hello. Uh, <laughs> okay, uh, thanks a lot, uh, Patricio. Very uh, interesting talk. Um, so I was... Um, wondering in your categorization of uh, billionaires, you had the uh, extractors, the financiers, uh, the large traders, and uh, one other group, sorry if I uh, don't remember. But uh, if you think about uh, billionaires nowadays, you have sportists, celebrities, actors, uh, and so on. Um, and back in the day, you also had monarchs who just had a lot of money because they had a lot of money. Um, because they inherited it. And uh, also, nowadays, you also have people who just have a lot of money because they are in uh, a position of, of power. And I don't know how these people would um, yeah, appear in your uh, data set or in your categorization. Could you elaborate on that? Sure. Very good question. It's, uh, like I said, uh, um, these are sort of historical categories and we just uh, try to show some of the patterns using prevailing categories but you're going precisely to the point that maybe I didn't make sufficiently clear uh, that generally the categories we use for example to differentiate between different areas of production or different types of magnates or different types of activities are highly historical specific, right? Let's take, I don't know, let's take for example, uh, billionaires who uh, are deriving their wealth because they're using genetic procedures to improve livestock, for example, of whom there's uh, quite a few in the Forbes data set. Where would you have fit that into the categories that make sense for the 17th or 18th century? Where would you have fit it in terms of the manufacturing agriculture divide that we use to understand distinctions in the, in the 19th or 20th century? 
as the division of labor in the world, as, a, as areas of accumulation become much more highly specific, right? Certain kinds of categories lose meaning. They no longer make sense, right? Manufacturing no longer captures the essence of how wealth is accumulated in the world today. In the way, at least to the extent that it did in the 19th century. So, so you're totally right. I mean, there's some activities that no longer fit into any of the prevailing categories that were used in the development literature in the, in the, in the 20th century because the division of labor has moved along too far. And in the same way, the division of labor was much, much undifferentiated in the 15th, 16th century to be able to identify an individual who was clearly associated with commerce or clearly associated with, with manufacturing. Those individuals tended to be engaged in a whole range of activities that totally overlap those areas. You know, the extraction of natural resources was tied to monopolies that were granted by the state and you had to be, uh, uh, you had to be, uh, uh, you have to be um, included in those power networks in order to gain those type of monopolies. And usually they themselves had to then figure out ways of commercializing those activities and, and were themselves the financiers that would then try to extend the scope of their activities to other areas. So the categories that we use, I mean, we obviously for the purpose of this exposition, we use some of the salient ones that uh, people have in their minds, but those categories are pretty useless. Let's say, uh, let me put it another way, 20th century categories are, very, are, are, are relatively useless to differentiate different types of activities in the 15th, 16th century. They're also kind of useless to differentiate different types of activities in the 21st century, right? The characteristics of the overall process have changed so significantly that what made sense for the 19th and 20th century was very particular to that era. I don't know if that answers. Uh, yes, uh, absolutely. Thank what you, very you were much. aiming at in the question. Yes. No? Um, Tom, I see there's a question in the chat. How, in your view, does this lead to what you call the underpinning of Schumpeter's creative destruction? I don't know if it is the underpinning or if it is the uh, indicators that provide evidence as to the ongoing processes of creative destruction. Uh, for us, uh, uh, I mean, if you follow the notion of creative destruction, the idea, uh, and, and, I'm, and I'm sure many of you are already familiar with this, but the basic notion is that uh, for Schumpeter, capitalism is primarily a system that is constantly engaged in creative destruction. Creative meaning uh, that the, 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 the way in which this system, quote unquote, functions is to constantly generate innovations that give temporary competitive advantages to those who are involved in those innovating areas of production. According to the argument, that gives them, uh, that gives them uh, exceptional levels of profit, right? Because of that, temporary protection they have from competition and, 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 and competitors. Uh, if that's the case, then it would follow that if we found evidence of concentrations and upsurges in wealth, those upsurges might be associated precisely with, a, 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 might provide precisely evidence of the occurrence of those peaks of innovation associated with creation. Does that make sense? Over time, for Schumpeter, for various reasons, 
these innovations become diffused and they become the normal state of business that then generates new areas of innovation. Uh, but, but that's for Schumpeter, this continual process that characterizes capitalism. So if you look at uh, one of the articles that we sent, it uh, tries to bring together Schumpeter's notion of creative destruction with Kuznet's account of, a, a, of processes of inequality to uh, show the relationship between the two and how uh, 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 the assumptions of, 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 of um, Kuznets are radically transformed if you shift notions of creative destruction to the dual model that he had in mind between agriculture and industry. Let me let me uh, ask a second question on the same one. Um, so I understood from your explanation that the creative destruction process manifests itself here in when you go up in the curve where they have this opportunity there and they accumulate wealth. But then isn't it also so that and this has nothing more to do with Schumpeter then, that to explain why they go down again, then you have to bring in power and political power. Take the Dutch example. They go, they go down um, after the United Kingdom uh, made some efforts to abolish slavery. As most of their richness was from slave trade, they went down, but not the English. That That's was right. political. That's right. I, I, and maybe we can elucidate more clearly which is the strategic dimension of greatest importance at any particular point in time. Sometimes it's power, sometimes it's a competition in the form of other technological innovations. You know, there's a complex, there's a complex interplay of, of, of these various dimensions. No, so but 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 yes, I mean the relationship that these patterns of accumulation have to world to, to different forms of power and power relations plays a very important role in explaining these cycles as they evolve. No, I mean there's a, in part there's a purely internal component, which is that you know. <laughs> to put it in very simple terms, if you get a lot of people making a lot of money, others are going to try to figure out how they can do the same and what can they can do to replicate what uh, is providing access to wealth for others, right? And, and that in itself provide, tends to provide, a, a, tends to provide a, a force that ends up, a, a, that ends up uh, undermining the innovative character of these innovations, or to put it, it, the innovative character of these strategies, or to put it in another way, ends up undermining the temporary monopoly that those innovations provided to those groups. No? What they do when those challenges emerge no, is one of the questions that we try to look at in, in this database, because the, uh, over time, there are remarkably few individuals slash families that are able to persist over time at the same levels of accumulation. Um, thank you, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, I see Henry has another one. Let me quickly go there. Okay, thank you, uh, Professor. I, I was just wondering, uh, maybe I missed this from your introductory slides, but I was wondering how much you're kind of like, whether you're able to include, first of all, like countries globally, or whether your coverage is more in US and Europe, that sort of thing. And kind of a second part of the question is how much sort of do sort of does political influence, for example, or political leaders or world leaders go into your kind of analysis? Because I'm thinking of individuals such as uh, the Russian Tsar, the um, Japanese, Chinese emperors, for instance, in those kinds of societies where kind of wealth and power really is concentrated, 
into the lead. And if you are sort of not friends with the dictator or leader, then, you know, you are really not in a position at all. So there you have kind of the within society inequality is really at a very high and very kind of um, specific level. And probably that's also something where it's very difficult to even kind of estimate or see how much wealth do these individuals have, how much power do they have, because that can be very hidden as well and just no, not yeah. something as easily observable. So how much do you think that kind of, how, how is that kind of coverage in, in your analysis? Very, 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 very good question. So, so uh, um, I, I, I didn't present any data on this regard. Uh, uh, I, I, all right, but let me put it another way. I didn't present any of the data in, 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 in this regard. But one of our interests was precisely uh, to try to see whether uh, there is, what are the periods in which there tends to be greater dissociation between uh, the concentration of power and wealth in the same hands. And, and there are uh, several individuals in our database that, that, that clearly uh, brought those two together. Uh, uh, they are emperors. They are uh, political figures who uh, simultaneously concentrated uh, both dimensions. Uh, and, 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 and part of what we're uh, trying to see is uh, precisely whether uh, that uh, relate, how that relationship changes over time. No, it, and it clearly does change over time in significant ways. Uh, in the same way that even the meaning of property changes over time in significant ways. And the, the, the relationship of, of landed property to power changes uh, over time. Uh, so that the data hopefully provides an insight into the timing of some of those transformations. Uh, but the other question that you were raising, uh, uh, which was, Oh, um, which was okay. So, 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 so the other question was on, on the one hand, on the difficulties of trying to classify different types of wealth. So, uh, when the database becomes public, it will have a uh, different degrees of confidence on individual data points. The, you know, there are some individuals for whom we have a fairly precise estimates of the level of wealth. And, and usually the threshold we have been using is kind of a functional equivalent of current day billionaires. It, but, but, but in some cases, the data are sufficiently clear to uh, be able to associate uh, very specific figures with some of these individuals. But that goes all the way to individuals who we suspect of having been the equivalent of billionaires, but for which there are absolutely no data that we have been able to identify. Look, I mean, we understand that this database is only a very, we're sort of doing what those uh, uh, astronomers trying to identify novas were doing in the 1930s. And uh, we have no doubts that uh, these kind of data Base, by its very nature is likely to change, improve, and be revised over time. And that's why uh, when, when, the, when we publish the book on it, 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 the data will simultaneously become available for, for general use. And that includes ways of providing uh, feedback into the data. Nonetheless, even with all those limitations, uh, I then have quite a bit of time to go into these details, but uh, the data help uh, uh, complicate even the story of colonial expansion, because what we find in the data was in the, uh, that in the territories that today we will consider India or the territories that today we will consider to be China, there were also epicenters of wealth accumulation that not only uh, were associated with the expansion of those colonial networks, but in fact, help finance the expansion of those colonial networks. There were uh, there are instances in in our database of, of for example, these uh, world magnets located in India, you know, who provided financial support to the East India Company, uh, and 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 and. and 
And that's the kind of a, a somewhat surprising patterns that, 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 that the data can produce, no? It, so, 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 so <laughs> we're like very cognizant and, 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 and aware of the limitations of the data set. Uh, we're very excited about the way in which the, uh, these data allow us to reframe some critical questions regarding this long period. I hope that went to the questions you were raising. Thank you very much. Um, is there another question? On the colonization process that you just uh, mentioned, um, if you look at the, the data, um, the very interesting data on, on the different sectors in which uh, the magnates uh, were present and how they evolved over time. Um, well, I have two questions there. Uh, one is on the relative unimportance of uh, resource extraction, as you mentioned. Um, so that seems to be a bit in contradiction with uh, what we usually think of the colonization process, that it, that it, it, it was really a, a very important uh, uh, event economically or in, in world uh, history speaking. And then, but then my other question is also, so here you're counting the number of magnates or you're counting the wealth accumulated by magnates, because of course no, that I'll might be. make a difference. And then uh, the other question is, of course, uh, indeed, as you mentioned already, the, um, the relationship between resource extraction on one hand and the financing of these kinds of uh, activities. Huh? So it's possible that, that in part, the, the colonization process is visible rather in, in the financial uh, curve than, than in the resource extraction curve. Actually, that's a great, that's, those are great questions. And, uh, and we haven't yet, gone into that direction that, 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 that is uh, those are fascinating questions what would these patterns look like uh, uh, he, you know part of the issue is that we uh, precisely because we were we, we were concentrating right now on 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 identifying the degree of confidence that we have on uh, our estimates of wealth with various data uh, points, uh, uh, we will have to put a little bit of work into figuring out how to aggregate that into estimates of wealth totals for particular periods or particular areas or particular fields of production. So, so that's a fascinating question. And hopefully at some point, uh, either we'll get it to it or some people using the data set might be able to get to it. it, it same thing applies to the second question. We haven't yet uh, looked at uh, in great detail precisely because of the same reasons about differences in the levels of wealth generated in each of these sectors. Uh, um, I didn't really speak about it in detail, but uh, 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 if any of you are familiar with Giovanni Arrighi's long 20th century, part of the argument there has to do with uh, the, the shift from production to finance and and that is part of what we're trying to assess in the project. I, I would say that so far, what the data would seem to suggest is that uh, the, 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 the regular cycle that Giovanni hypothesizes was probably a little bit less prevalent than, 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 than what he assumed, uh, but, but we haven't yet uh, refined that area of findings. If you allow uh, two small questions, you, you talked about the exciting uh, part of it, where you find surprisingly that, for example, in India, you had local wealth magnates who co-financed uh, East Indian company. 
were they uh, British functionaries, were they East Eastern company staff, or were they Indian? And then the second question, as overall, all the one categories you analyzed spatially uh, either were European or came from Europe, would it be good to conclude that building a settler state like the US is more efficient than colonizing and going away again? I guess I, 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 I would sort of uh, uh, sort of shift the argument just a little bit and say that uh, given the existence of these colonizing empires uh, moving away from the expansion of colonizing empires uh, was a innovative practice for others to deploy, you know, and 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 uh, uh, you know, being able to exploit the weaknesses of uh, the the these colonial networks, right? Being able to uh, target the areas in which uh, in which uh, uh, escaping state monopolies or advocating for free trade or advocating for, for the end of slavery uh, in different ways could also provide innovative ways of, of, of uh, advancing new strategies of accumulation. No, uh, in the same way that, that in the same way uh, in the same way that uh, if one were to analyze, for example, you know, to take it to more modern times, if one were to analyze the New Deal kind of model that prevailed in, uh, again, quote unquote, industrialized countries in the 20th century, uh, uh, coming up with strategies of uh, in, in, shifting investments and production facilities to other countries and or for other uh, entrepreneurs in other countries to uh, engage in uh, competitive activities uh, uh, could become a innovation relative to those new deal type of arrangements. I'm not sure whether I'm being uh, totally clear here, no? I mean, I think that that, that a, a, a particular institutional arrangements targeted to handle inequality tend to function for a while and then tend to be undermined by the tensions they generate. You know, slavery generated one set of tensions, slavery and the whole edifice of, of mercantilism that was associated with it, it, it generated one kind of edifice, it, it, the imperial strategy of uh, uh, promoting free trade by England uh, generated its opportunities relative to existing arrangements, but its own constraints as well, right? Uh, and, and something similar can be said for the uh, New Deal kind of model promoted in the United States in the 20th century. No? So there's a kind of evolution uh, to, to these uh, innovations in which uh, precisely the creative component is the ways in which they go against the grain of existing arrangements. Okay, I I take the or I take misuse of my position as chair to ask another question. Um, it's a question on on um, well how how this data set in fact does now inform us about um, inequality and and growth. In fact, what you you could inter because you're just looking at magnates huh? and you do not know where exactly their wealth comes from, whether it is connected indeed directly to a process of creative destruction 
um, and then how it would be creative and how it would be destructive huh? uh, or where it would be destructive. It could be that it is destructive in entirely different parts of the world where uh, compared to where the, the, um, the wealth is accumulated or not. Huh? Um, okay. And then and another question related to this is also um, how is the wealth shared? Huh? Um, you mentioned at some point in uh, well when discussing the, the 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 example of the Netherlands or the evolution of the Netherlands that this was related to a relatively uh, equal society or or I think you called it the fragmented society or something where in fact which didn't allow a lot of accumulation of wealth so that there you made a link with with uh, inequality or with equality, in fact, in, in the region itself. No? That's right. And, and, and uh, I don't know whether maybe one of the ways of, of, of dealing with this particular question is by referring back and maybe uh, even from the point of view of, of uh, perhaps the more contemporary interests of some of the colleagues working on inequality, uh, what a lot of our research originated in trying to understand better the relationship of inequality between countries and inequality within countries in the late 20, in the latter half of the 20th century and early 21st century. Uh, inequality between countries through the, this whole pe most of the period that we've been looking at reached a peak in the 1980s, 1990s, uh, that had never been experienced before. And we were wondering how that was related to the decline in many uh, wealthier countries of inequality during the 20th century. And it's relation whether there was a shift taking place in the late 20th century in the relative role of of, 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 of uh, each of these dimensions. And, 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 and if you look at the article um, that we sent uh, with them about theorizing the relationship between economic growth and inequality, uh, the argument here is that it's precisely uh, because the previous model, it's precisely because patterns of accumulation in the 20th century entailed the exclusion of poor countries of the world that paradoxically that generated a strong incentive for a dramatic shift in the late 20 and early 21st century where a lot of these production activities got relocated to those poor countries. No? Uh, that would be an example and, 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 the, and its impact at the, at the level of several industrial nations which has been a, a, at least experienced as rising inequality. No? So, so at the very beginning of the project, the effort was precisely to try to understand how, again, quote unquote, domestic patterns of inequality are linked to inequality as it manifests itself between nations, no? And, 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 and that's what we ultimately continue to aim towards in all of these different dimensions of this of these, uh, research initiative. Okay. I uh, thank you very much, uh, Patricio Korsenjevic, for this uh, presentation and also for engaging in, in to the discussion. I propose that we, we end it here. Uh, but um, yeah, I think it was very interesting uh, reflection we could have on, on global inequality. And indeed, uh, I think the value of your work is, is exactly on, on how you connect uh, international patterns also to, to domestic patterns of, uh, of growth and inequality. Thank so, you. I thank want to you thank you much. all for taking the time to uh, participate in this event. And like I said, uh, these days I don't get much of a chance to talk about my own research. Uh, so, so this was a very welcome opportunity uh, to, 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 to do so. <laughs>
Uh, so, so I appreciate uh, your participation very much.